What's up, everyone? This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I interviewed Michael Gervais, sports psychologist. Mike works with everyone from NFL players to Olympians, NHL, MLB, um, top-level executives and performance of all different kinds. In this show, we go into everything mental, uh, everything from mindfulness to brain mapping to gratitude, journaling, uh, s- tricks, strategies, conversations that he has and, and gives to all of these top level performers. So I know you're going to walk away from this with a ton of new knowledge. Before we get started, um, if you're interested in keeping up with all of the free content that we're putting out, podcasts, videos, uh, blog articles, free programming, stuff like that, go to BruteStrengthTraining.com, sign up for the newsletter. Hope you enjoy the show. What's up, everyone? I'm here with Michael Gervais of the Seattle Seahawks. Am I saying that right, Mike? It is Michael Gervais. Gervais. All right, man. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for making time out of your busy schedule for me, man. I'm, uh, I could not be more excited about this interview. Uh, cool. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. So officially, you are the sports psychologist of the Seahawks. Do you have any other titles with any other organizations? I know you've worked with a million different uh, professional athletes and performers. Yeah, that's a great question. I technically, um, so let me bring you into the windy kind of complicated world of licensing in the world in the world of psychology is that technically I'm licensed in California as a sports psychologist. And why that's important is because um, you can only use the word psychologist if you're licensed. And um, that means that you're doing particular type of work. You're working like a, a deep, rich level um, on the psychological domain of performance. And there's other variations as well. There's some people that have their degrees, advanced degrees in kinesiology, and there's a very different type of work that they're doing, which is um, not the deep um, psychological-based work, but more like goal setting and mindset training and um, confidence building and, 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 and said. Not that the licensed folks don't do that, but there's also a depth uh, they're permitted to go to. And then there's also people in the world of psychology that are doing um, primarily mindset work, like like similar to the kinesiology folks. And I know it's complicated and windy, but the reason I just wanted to just kind of start off on the right vector is that I'm not doing the deep, deep work up at the Seattle Seahawks. And everybody knows that um, in the organization and, and otherwise that the work I'm doing there is really working on mindset and paying attention to just the strategies um, from an overall high performance standpoint that helps support the team's goals and the team culture. And um, if there's ever a clinical issue or something that is really rich in nature of the psychological perspective, uh, there's a team of folks that I refer to up there. So it's just a small little vector. Most people wouldn't care about it, but I want to make sure that accuracy is part of this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. And, mm-hmm. and, and right now, um, is, is, is the, are the Seahawks the only organization that you're working with? Um, no, there's, there's handfuls. Okay. And, um, so like in a couple of weeks, I'm punching down to Rio for the Olympic games to be able to spend time with U S women's indoor and volleyball as well as women's beach. Um, so yeah, so, and there's lots of other projects that I'm involved in from both a professional sports standpoint, but um, much of my time is is allocated to um, a business that Coach B. Carroll and I started up that's taking his intellectual property, my intellectual property, and uh, moving that into CEOs of Fortune 50 companies and their 100 to 300,000 employees. And so that's been an incredible venture and partnership with Coach Carroll that I've really enjoyed. Wow. Is that this business, is that something that the general pub, uh, population can access or is it only available to those uh, CEOs? Yeah. So it's not just the CEOs, actually. I, it's, um, it's a little too narrow in scope, but it is, uh, it, there's lots of business models. And our business model was instead of going to the masses, we have like just a handful of clients, and those handful of clients um, purchase our service and product for 
their 100,000, theoretically, their 100,000 employees. And so, no, it's not open on um, for the general public. We'll get there at some point, but we're going like really deep and long inside of corporations right now. Wow. So what makes you so good at your job that you've become the sports psychologist and, and coach of so many of these top level performers? Oh my God, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have no idea. I, I, I will tell you this, that I, I, I love, I flat out love what I do. And I, I just really am amazed by what's possible for humans. And um, there's just such an amazing, we are amazing people. And there's so much that is untapped for us that I've just spent my life efforts trying to sort out, like, how does the mind work? Um, to become optimal, and what are the strategies, the principles, the the sturdy practices that allow people to per- to pursue their potential, which is kind of a fancy word for like relentlessly get better to figure out what good looks like for um, an individual. And so I don't know, I just love it. I think it's a, like it's almost like an insolvable puzzle. I think it's really complicated. The mm-hmm. mind is really, really complicated, and it's invisible. And it's nothing to just muck around with. Every thought has a consequence. And that consequence either builds or um, debilitates our ability to be fluid, to be intense, to be exactly in the present moment in the right way, in the right context. And, you know, it's just, it's beautiful and it's complicated. And we're still just starting out to understand how the mind works. And I love it. And it's, um, so I don't know. I don't know if that translates to your question, but... Um, you know, I think that most people, when they say, um, when I'm not around, they'd say, oh, you know what, my, I don't know, Mike just helps me be present and just helps, has helped me figure out the ways that I can reveal and trust myself, reveal the insight and wisdom within myself and I can trust myself and I just feel like I have better control of, of my mind um, from the work that we do. So I don't know, maybe that's two ways to think about it. I love it and I think that that's kind of the, the end game that we're working towards, insight and wisdom and being present more often, even in rugged and hostile moments when it feels like all we want to do is escape and, right. and you know, remove ourselves from that intensity. That's a perfect answer. So I'm curious what <clears throat> you're talking about helping others with uh, being more present and, and stuff like that. What daily practices do you have to keep that yourself? Well, at first, um, you know, and it's a really good question because it's so much more than just a daily practice. Yes, we do need to train our mind. There's only three things as humans we can train. We can train our body, our craft, <laughs> and our mind. And that's it. And so that's a, that's a wonderful question about how do we train our mind? Like what are those practices to be present? Because the natural state of our mind is easily distracted. It's sloppy. It's all over the place. It's curious. It is trying to create survival mechanisms rather than optimization strategies. And unless we have an intimate relationship with our mind, we're going to be pulled by that drunk monkey, so to speak. Um, That's an old kind of play on some Eastern thought that the mind is like a drunk monkey. And so the practices really are um, a process of, of relentless self-discovery, to work to become, to know who you are, and to be able to stand then, once you know who you are better, and I'll talk about how to do that, then being able to stand with conviction in any moment, then being able to have command of your craft, of your body and your mind, and hostile and rugged and, and quiet and calm and intimate and loving moments, whatever those are for you. And we have each one of those all you know, during the days. Um, it's not just when the lights turn on and it's competition time. So that, that's kind of the way I think about the strategy. And then there's nothing more important about the self-discovery process, knowing who you are. Epictetus, one of the great philosophers, said, know who you are and dress accordingly. You know, that's me putting it into kind of a more modern frame. Right. But so many of us don't know who we are, so we're trying to be like somebody else. And we're never able to really authentically express ourselves. And once we know who we are, the most powerful part of that process, and that's the discovery pro- this self-discovery process, nobody can take it away from us. Nobody can take away who you are. No, the lights, the cameras, the, the rumors on um, and the snickering on social, the glare from another person, the competitor that's 
you know, um, dominating you in whatever competition. Nobody can take away who you are. So it always begins with the process of figuring out who you are. Then you can apply the mental skills to be able to adjust when it's difficult. And, I, you know, I, there's more for me to say about this, obviously, but I just want to set that there's a framework first, then uh, mental skills on top of it. I love that. So, Mike, how can I figure out who I am? I mean, that is the life journey. Right. And, you know, it, so there's, I think there's three ways of doing it. One is um, being around wise people, you know, and not people that are going to give you advice and answers, but being around people that have experienced wisdom and setting that tribe and community experience for yourself so that you're not just taking from them, but you're adding and contributing to their well being as well. So that, that tribal experience of being around wise people is um, priceless because they ask questions. They, look, they challenge you to be the best version of yourselves because that's what wisdom is really about. It's the, it's the journey and the inner experience to reveal what's inside. And um, so that's the first part. Uh, the, the second part, so th that's about the community and, and being part of switched on conversations where the tone is exactly right for you. And that doesn't mean it's comfortable. It's exactly right. Then the second part is um, journaling. So it doesn't sound sexy and popular, you know, as a as a process, but it externalizes your thoughts. And if you want to know yourself, you need to understand your thoughts. And so moving those thoughts out of your head onto concrete, a forcing function process to make them concrete on you know paper, as concrete as paper is, which is obviously mixed <laughs> analogy there, but forcing that function to examine your thoughts is really important. And then the third is um, mindfulness and being able to be present and watch your thoughts and um, not be attached to your thoughts. But without judgment, just observe and follow and wink and smile and pay attention and you know notice what comes up and what goes away. And that's those are the three processes that I think are part of the self-discovery process. Then you wrap that in doing that in quiet, calm moments, doing that in rugged and hostile moments. Right. And the more we push our boundaries, which your community is really good at this, I'm not sure how good they are at the quiet, calm, mm -hmm. which is a not so much. Yeah, which is necessary. You know, if we're always going to be hard, then where's mm -hmm. the soft? And if we're always uh, working on being strong, where's the flexibility? And I, I'm just using metaphors that I know that physi physiologically you guys answer really well. Um, but that also goes uh, for the psychological dimension. If we want to accelerate our craft and accelerate, you know, the life journey of being the best, the best person we can possibly become in this very short nano blimp of a blip of a time mm -hmm. on, on Earth that we have. It's it's funny you said you, you talked about um, you don't know how good this population is with the the, the quiet side of things. I interviewed uh, the now two-time games champion uh, Katrin David's daughter, and she is mm. one of the only the only CrossFit athletes that I've heard say anything about a mindfulness practice. Um, and I think I think it's about to. I think we're kind of in a, a changing time as far as our athletes go, our top athletes. It's such a new sport, and uh, a lot of these athletes haven't, you know, they've never been professionals before. And so I think we're about to turn the corner into this kind of thing. So it's really, but, it's a really cool yeah. time. And God, what a, what a dominant competitor she is. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is like, it's like one of those athletes, no matter where she is stacked, like you cannot count her out. Like mm -hmm. she understands the competitive nature and that, and competitiveness is not a physical attribute. Competitiveness is a mental attribute. It all is about how you work your mind. And if you want to be a great competitor, you've got to figure yourself out so that you can purposely um, organize your thoughts in a way that support you to be great. And you can wink and say hello and goodbye to thoughts that are getting in the way or slowing you down. And that, you know, remember, sports just a way to figure out who you are. That's it, period. There's nothing more to it. Like mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the depth of what sport is. And the origins of sport were to, to train warriors in times of non war. And war is the ultimate, like the ultimate test. You know, it's like you've got your craft and your mind. And in the ancient times, it was your, your hands, your head, and your feet. And that's all you had, maybe a weapon. And so it's the most ancient testing of a man and a woman to be able to be grounded and present in the most rugged environment. So let's never lose the origins of what we're doing. And then at the same time, because we're not 
we're not stricken by that intensity of somebody working to kill us on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's just frickin' play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like, like it's not that serious. And so being able to have that, you know, that fun play. Now I say all of this, this is a process that comes from self-discovery and that's not an excuse for being able to train your mind in more concrete ways, which was the original question that jumped us off on this. <laughs> I feel like I'm on a little soapbox. But Dude, I love it. This is phenomenal. Yeah. I, I, I want to back up for a second. Uh, the journaling, is there a process that you recommend or just throw your thoughts down on paper in whatever way you want? Yeah, I mean, it's like there's so many different ways to do this. Sure. And you, you can, I would say one play let your let your thoughts run like just play and learn that's a really clear structure um, which is very loose and oftentimes it's so intimidating to people that they give up after the third day of journaling you know it's like right. I don't know what I'm doing well yeah that, that makes sense because it's you do anything for three times four times um, hit a heavy bag you know try to snatch you know whatever it is like you're not going to be good at it you're not going to understand the value in it um, but once you spend time with it, it becomes very apparent. Then if you want something more structured and formal, there's a series of questions that um, anyone in your community that's intelligent and, and smart um, would challenge you to answer. Like the most ancient of questions is who am I? And if you answer that question, whether it's in a mindfulness practice or a written practice, um, it's a lifelong question every day. Who am I? And it's sitting with that question and being authentically real with that question will take you to places that are very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And your community um, you prides themselves on doing the uncomfortable. But sometimes doing the physically hard is really not that uncomfortable. It's just, you know, it's just this temporary inner struggle where lactic acid and brandy kinase is coursing through your system. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right? That, like, that's the worst of it. Right. And, and we also know that you can play with the central governor as well and manipulate that threshold of intensity. And your community really has demonstrated very well the importance of pushing to the edge mm -hmm. to learn who you are. And once you're on the edge, then you can figure out because your, your inner voice is screaming at you. And, but that's, the, that's not the right time to figure yourself out. That's the right time to build capacity, mm -hmm. to stress your system, both physiologically and psychologically. The right time to figure you out is in moments when um, uh, you can play and be fluid and it's at the edge of intensity where you're building capacity to reveal who you are not figure yourself out I want to go a little bit deeper into that and, and using Katrin as a, an example again there were three four five different moments in the uh, in the CrossFit games where when everyone else is slowing down, she picks it up, right? And she finishes faster than she started. And she, and she almost looks, uh, you know, more than human, uh, ex extraordinary in, in comparison to her competitors. Is there a way that you can uh, practice that, teach that to athletes, like that final push? Yeah, there's three starts to every event. There's the, the, the first whistle, if you will, is when you determine the event starts. That's, that's something that many competitors miss. The second start is when the whistle blows. And that's usually when people are, are thinking that the real start is. Okay, So that's the second start. And the third start is when you're in deep water. And being able to reset there, um, I think, is, an important, is a really important process or a strategy for people that are great competitors. Because they're looking for those moments where other people are fragile and fatigued and they know that that is where they excel because they've trained their mind through training the capacity building process of their body. And so if you've got a great physical engine and your mind is weak, you'll be average. If you've got an incredible mind and your body is um, weak, you'll, you won't even be average. Like you need, like it makes sense that you would train body and craft first. And then in a, um, the third evolution, your mind. Uh, but that would be something that great competitors now that are contemporaries, they've trained body, mind, and craft all at the same time. And you know, if I stitch back your last question, which is um, about the journaling process to be more concrete, 
one very, very simple process that we ask all athletes that I work with to do is post-practice, just to answer two simple questions. What went well and what do I want to work on? And that there's, they're very strategically designed questions because what went well supports the idea of um, facilitating the mechanics of confidence. And that's a whole deeper, longer conversation. Mm -hmm. And then what do I want to work on sets vision. It sets many little goals and it sets them in a positive direction as opposed to what, you know, where did I blow it? And what right. do I need what to do? What went to wrong? Yeah. yeah. I love yeah, that. Yeah. Or, or what, even what do I, the question, the subtlety of the question, what do I want to fix is very different than what do I want to work on? Mm -hmm. This is a choice, you know, and, and if we lose track of that every day in modern times for the privileged, um, the, and I don't mean financially, but the privilege that of those of us who are not in the middle of war, um, or choosing not to be in that place like shit this is just a, a life um, that is wonderful and it's not that way for everybody so gratitude is just such a rich part of the process that is great I want to ask one more clarifying or d dive into the mindfulness a little bit and then we'll move on I ha I've uh, recommended it to all of our competitive athletes uh, I write about it a lot and everything like that and I've had a really hard time getting people to stick to it. Um, some people I have a hard time ever getting them to start it. Um, I've done it for about eight years off and on and I know the benefits that it's had on, on my own life and my own mental health. And so um, I'm just very convicted of it. Is there a way that I can communicate differently with these athletes that will uh, help them stick to it a little bit better? Um. I don't know how you're doing it. So I, it's a tough question Great point. for me to answer. <laughs> Great point. Well, it's usually, I, I don't, I don't really go much into detail. I just describe it as training your mind and allowing yourself a little more space. Uh, it's a way to relieve stress and I don't, I don't really go into it much more than that. And I usually, um, forward them to, a guided meditation on YouTube or something like Headspace. Yeah, I th I don't know. Um, I think that that like when we're helping others in whatever capacity, whether it's a loving relationship or or a coaching relationship, whatever it is, or friendship, you know, it's like knowing who the person is and appropriately nudging them. Mm -hmm. And you, ca you we can't ask people to go from pre-contemplation to adoption of new behavior. Like there's five stages of change uh, according to good science. Right. You know? And so just like knowing where somebody is in that process and working to get them just one step um, uh, more advanced than where they are now. So like having that psychological framework of uh, it's Prohaska's, uh, Pro Prohaska's uh, stages of change. Um, it's a wonderful model, and that's how one of the ways that we can accelerate people to actually make changes. And then I think what you're asking about is, um, you know, the, this is there's at least three other questions embedded in your question. One is habit formation, one is habit consistency, and then one is a compelling reason why they should start. And so, if we start in reverse order, the com the only compelling reason is that you live it and that's you mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. if you know I this I don't want to be aggressive in this statement but um, because I know the same is the case for me but when you are living it mm -hmm. then other people are saying what's up with him what does Michael have how has he become that guy like he's just so fill in the blanks and then once that's part of the process they are they'll they want will want to invest so that's the curiosity piece is that you're the best you're the best advocate for a particular science or a particular practice or a particular psychological framework or a particular philosophy it's you and the way that you live and then the second is habit formation like that there's a good science around that and just figuring out the right triggers and the right time of the day and and then habit you know consistency building is um, usually requires a inner conviction and or a community and so I don't know there's there's a lot behind that question so no that's great advice I yeah I appreciate that yeah uh, what, what is your goal-setting process with athletes new athletes mm -hmm. 
not very good. Yeah, I, I, I just, not, I'm not very, I, the, the research is pretty good on goal setting. And um, I'm just not bullish on, bullish on goals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, it just feels so mechanical to me. And I don't feel as I'm, I am mechanical and humans are mechanical. There is value in being really clear about what's important. And there can be a great value of writing that down and externalizing it you know, to our, our earlier conversation. So I, I, I'm just, I'm not great at it. And there's better people to ask than me about goal setting. Fair enough. Yeah, more, I should say, maybe not better people, but more skilled people in the, in the goal setting process. Right. That, that, that being said, Michael, I do ask everyone, like, what are you working on? What, what, what does success look like? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the things that you want to get better at? So for me, it's more of a high performance model and shaping a model with the person and not so much like concrete target goals by three months. There, there are better people that, that um, or be more skilled people in that process. Right. I think I've, I've seen maybe, maybe a paraphrase of something you've said a few times uh, to your athletes where it's something like, if everything goes right at the end of the season, what does that look like for you? Mm -hmm. That's right. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, it's just working on helping get really crisp on, and the question is not like it, um, the, the, what you just paraphrased, like if everything goes right, what that really means is like at the end of the season, at the end of the year, at the end of your life, whatever we're, we're talking about, what are we doing? <laughs> and what does it look like when, it, when it's working the way that you would hope? And it's just this idea of getting clear in your mind what, it, what the aim is. And where that comes from is that when something really matters to you, to me, to, to your loved ones, you'll do whatever it takes. You'll do whatever it takes when it really matters. And so for you to know what matters is like step one. And that's just part of a conversation to help me understand and maybe them to articulate what matters most. What does that look like? And, you know, grandma will, you know, lift a car. You'll do whatever it takes. I'd step in front of a, a moving van for my, a moving bus for train, whatever the analogy is for loved ones, like whatever it takes. And um, I just think that that's a, an anchoring process to get really clear about what's it look like, but are you willing to put in the work? How much does it matter mm -hmm. to you is the most important question. Do you ever have people come to you talking about uh, having trouble staying motivated? Mm. Great question. Um, I, I hope you aren't going to, I feel like I'm not giving you um, necessarily easy answers. It's to perfect. It's literally yeah, perfect. And, and it's like, it's just not easy stuff. And mm -hmm. the answer is to answer your question. No, the answer is no, because I don't know, like seriously, a hundred percent of people I work with are, extremely motivated <laughs> and they're very clear about what matters to them and they're going to they're invested their life efforts to do that work mm -hmm. they also happen to be the top you know half of half of one percent of people of performers in their craft so they're already demonstrated a life journey and they're in a space where um, they're more artistic than they are mechanical so but I, your question about motivation is really important which is that there's two basic types of motivation, internal and external. And you know what, what people struggle, it's usually because they're over-indexed on externally, uh, external rewards, such as attention, a, a way that they are going to look or be perceived, getting a new record, and you know, uh, having a bigger house, a bigger car, a bigger watch, having more fans on whatever social. Um, getting a trophy, those are all external rewards, making more money. And it's not that those things are bad or inherently nothing wrong with any of them. But once they are experienced, then what? Then what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the, the trap in external motivators are that they're outside of your control. And so it just becomes this kind of undulation, yo-yo, up and down experience and that's, I think, what's laced in your question is when people are struggling with motivation, what, what's really going on there? 
are they lazy? No, usually not. It's usually not that. That that can certainly be it. Like, um, it's usually an over-index on external rewards, and they don't really even maybe even know that. And or genetically, there's something that we need to take a look at. And or maybe it's a medical condition. So there's always those three things that we play with. Is it psychological, physiological, or genetic? Um, and you can't. If somebody is low on motivation, how, how do we know that they just don't have hypothyroid? How do we know that you know there's not some sort of dysthymia going on where there's a low level grade depression? So it's not it's not as simple as um, just one concrete answer, right? It's like having a, the, the ability to have a broad perspective to narrow down what exactly it is uh, that might be at the source for the person. Right. Assuming it's not genetic or chemical, what how how do you how do you teach people or talk to them, uh, you know, trying to get them to be become more internally motivated or, or, or focus on internal motivation? Okay, so first of all, um, I, I love that's a great question, and really, it's it is very important though to understand if it, it because people don't know if it's neurochemical or neuroelectrical if they have some sort of like low level grade depression mm -hmm. or hypothy hypothyroidism, they don't know. Right. So that if we just talk about the psychology piece, um, and really they're, you know, they're only firing on two cylinders, it's like not fair because now, now it's like you're mentally not strong. Well, that's not the case. It's actually physiological. Right. So, okay, so I just want to say that out loud. But is there, the, the, just yeah. to highlight that, is there a, are there signs? that uh, you know, coaches and athletes can look for to say, hey, I, maybe I need to get this checked out? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, enduring patterns of low-grade um, energies, of sadness, of loneliness, that, that's just depression. Anxiety is the same thing. You know, over, overactivation, uh, overactive mind that is a chronic worry about what could go wrong. Um, you know, hard to keep uh, – high cortisol levels are often associated with – and those are cheap markers that you can do quick tests with, cortisol swabs. Um, you know, the high cortisol is often associated with retaining fat, but that, that's not that important. What's important about high cortisol is that um, it, they're markers of extreme stress in the mm -hmm. system. And that's an anxious, depressed mind, whatever it might be. So there are some biological markers that you can take a look at that are low cost. Uh, C-reactive protein is another marker that is relatively low cost, um, but, but invasive. And so those are some quick little markers that we, people can look at, uh, and there's handfuls of others. But, um, to, but to answer your other question is, and sorry, and or having a skilled um, psychologist or mindset, mm -hmm. um, deep, deeply trained person on the mind around, and it's easy to sniff out from a trained professional. That being said, if let's say it is that they have some a motivation um, or they're demotivated, how do you help them? Um, get switched on is I think it's uh, a function of asking questions and it's you're not going to convince anybody but asking questions about what are they aligned for like what are they working towards and they say listen I just want the record or I want people to look turn their head when I take off my shirt or you know I just want to have a six pack or whatever you know whatever the thing is that they want uh, that's externally driven um, and just asking, like, what's underneath of that? What's that like for you? Mm -hmm. And when that happens and you get lots of people to look at you, like, what's, what happens next? It's just asking those questions and not in a condescending way, but really in a curious way. Like, what is this going to be like? Because the way that I think about um, people in communities is that we're agreeing to lock arms to help each other become better. And when we do that, uh, we're going to go through challenges together. And when we go through those challenges, what is it going to look like when you're getting what you say you want now and when you're not getting what you say? And so these are just uh, conversations and questions about where is this taking us? And eventually what takes place is that people talk about what they really want. It's, this, is, this is not rocket science. What they really want is they want to belong. They want to be part. They want to work from, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a mm -hmm. simple but wonderful model. Like they, they want safety, shelter, they want to belong, they want to love, they want to express that. And where that love conversation gets a little kinky is that they think they need to be loved as opposed to sharing love. They think they need to be doubted on rather than 
um, expressing gratitude. And so when we over-index on um, needing to be filled up from the exter- external world, mm-hmm. we, we ride that roller coaster of being up, going up and down with the fickleness of other people's temperament. Um, and, and sometimes that temperament is um, really, it really helps us because it's like, okay, you know, F that dude. You know what? Mm-hmm. He's, not, he's not giving me respect. And I'm going to get to the gym and I'm going to push. That's just temporary. <laughs> you know, it's like that's not really a great path of mastery. Right. Uh, and so asking those questions and then getting down to what people really want out of their life efforts, um, it, it, it usually is internally driven. That is awesome. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, I've, I heard you on a on some interview. I think it was a mindfulness uh, mindfulness conference of some sort, and I think you said like one of the best characteristics of these top level performers you work with is that they're not afraid to be vulnerable and try new things. So my mm-hmm. question is, are all of them like that? And if not, how do you teach them to you know become more like that, try, uh, trying new things, being vulnerable, etc. Well, I think that vulnerability and openness are accelerants to, to, um, to growth. And being able to grow at the fastest rate possible is part of the process of becoming the best version of you, the best competitor you can be. So, um, so that's just kind of what is laced underneath of that thought. But to answer your question, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's necessary, but vulnerability and openness to explore are part of the self-discovery process. And those that are on the world stage, like the top, top of top of, you know, half a percenters, are, um, they really do have some insight about themselves and how the world works. Is it necessary? There's nothing necessary. You know, there's, there's as many knuckleheads as mm-hmm. spiritual grounded people. There's as many, you know, off access pirates as there are cruise liner ship, you know, captains on the world stage. So there's no just one way to do it. And, um, but I certainly think that openness to change and grow is amazing. And also knowing when and how to hold firm, to hold fast, you know, to stay true to what you understand and and know is important. And we've got great models for this. Tiger Woods, best in the world, changes his his swing a couple times. That's rad, Mm -hmm. you know, and and that requires vulnerability to take a risk to do something new. And um, if we don't take risks and do new in the appropriate way, then we end up staying stagnant. You know, we end up playing it safe and small, and that's just a that's just a great recipe for stagnation. And you know, it's, so it's just like every day. What are you getting better at? What are you open to learning? And if you're open to learning, there's likely some vulnerability of not knowing. But vulnerability is a wonderful. It's not. There's nothing wrong with that. It's like being a lifelong learner. What's what, that's really cool, right. <laughs> you know? Like what's better than that? Uh, well, uh, being an expert for some people is better. Right. And but that's a that is really problematic when you go out of your domain. <laughs> and no, nobody really wants to. No one really likes being around guys that or gals that know it all. You know, mm-hmm. that's just it's not very fun. Right. Off axis pirates. I'm going to be using that one. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, what what is brain mapping? Is that something that you can explain over audio or? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. There's um, five brain waves that. Uh, well, there's uh, there's four that I'll pay attention to in this conversation. Four brain waves, neural electrical um, signal waves, and there, there's people that are far better at this that. But I, so I'm more of an applied practitioner in this space than a deep researcher. But there's alpha brain waves, beta brain waves, theta brain waves, and delta brain waves. And to oversimplify this, delta, when you're making delta brain waves, it's when you're in deep sleep, you know, in like a deep recovery, deep sleep mode. And they're just slow brain electrical activities, uh, uh, electrical signals. And then there's theta brain waves, which are um, a s- still uh, not as slow as delta. Not as deep, not as slow, but they're slow. And uh, the, the psychological or experiential characteristics that are accompanied theta is creativity um, as well as a wandering mind, like an ADD type of experience can happen with uh, theta brainwaves if those are when somebody's predominantly in that, in that rhythm. And then there's beta, which is really fast and, 
that's like that really deep switched on, um, deep moment to moment focus. Now, when we have too much beta, that looks like anxiety. And so too much of anything's a problem, right? Too much ketchup's a problem, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the sauce of choice is. And then alpha is this kind of neutral cruise control, more fluid brainwave. And beta is the fastest and delta is the slowest. Um, okay, so with that kind of conceptual piece in place, it gets much more textured and nuanced that there's particular structures in our brain that kind of do, and I say kind of because we're, brain scientist, um, it's just an exploding area of trying to figure out what this three pounds of silly putty in the skull of our, in our <laughs> skull really is. But there's particular regions um, and structures in our brain that likely do particular functions. And the most beautiful part about the brain is that there's zero redundancy, it's complicated, it's, it's um, beautiful, and we don't really know how it's working. But let's say, for example, the left prefrontal cortex, which is if you're holding like your a fi uh, two or three fingers over your left eyebrow, that's your left prefrontal cortex. You know, there's, we know kind of what happens in that area. There's judgment, there's, um, there's monitoring of self, and things that you'll be familiar with which is like the amygdala, you know, that part of your brain that is responsible for fight and flight and all many of the um, emotional response systems. Um, so anyways, uh, not to get too far away from it, is that what we would look at is particular brain patterns over particular regions of the brain. And, and we do understand that if we have too much theta, it's probably going to be really hard to focus deeply. If we have too much beta, which is that high focus, we're likely going to have in, um, performance anxiousness or general anxiousness um, in life. So we can, with neurofeedback, you can suppress beta, which is that high focus frequency, and or you can increase the re, um, alpha. And when you increase alpha, you get a little moment feedback, moment to moment feedback uh, in your uh, in your ear or visually to let you know that your brain just figured out and your mind just figured out how to produce alpha brain waves in a particular region. And that's, that's, what I just said is freaking complicated, you know, and, um, and the scientists in this area, one, Leslie Sherlin is phenomenal at this and he'd be a great guest for your folks. Um, if you're interested in meeting him, I'm happy to make an introduction. Definitely. And so, yeah, so one of the things that we do is we map people's brains to get a picture, a snapshot of what parts of their brain are working really well and what parts of their brain they can get better at. And asterisk right now, uh, your brain is different than your mind, right? The brain is that neuroelectrical, neurochemical, physical structure. The mind is something very, very different. The mind is the, um, the guider of mm -hmm. thoughts, the curator of thoughts, if you will. Absolutely. Okay, so... Um, so anyways, uh, like some of the elite athletes that want to get better see this as a competitive advantage where they can um, use a neurofeedback training system to be able to immediately suppress electrical signals that get in their way of them being fluid, of them being smooth, of them being intense, of them being focused, of, of them being calm. And that is trainable. So it's not just – so calm is not just a psychological um, – it's not just self-talk. It's not just breathing mechanisms that help us be calm. You can do great self-talk and be a great breather mechanically, but your brain produces too much beta brain waves, and it's like swimming upstream. Unless you're a salmon, that's really tough to do. So, um, you know, I think that uh, having this combination of mind and brain training is definitely um, uh, the, the, the wave of the future. That is awesome. Yeah, I'm going to follow up with you on that. I would love to dive into that more with him. And we uh, we actually have pretty low listenership from the salmon. So that's great advice. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, that's funny. I, and in some ways, like your your community really are all salmon. Like, you know, <laughs> you, know you guys are like, yeah. doing really difficult stuff. And um, with now with the advent of the CrossFit Games, cross, um, uh, what do I say, CrossFit Games, it's, just, it's what a fun community. Like mm -hmm. seriously, I, I love what you guys are doing. But they don't like to be called salmon. I think red fish is PC. <laughs> red, red. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Well, let's just stick with being pirates. Yeah, like, man. An, an off-axis pirate is really a cool way to to live life. As long as you're not like just plundering the world, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> Moving on. Um, I, I assume you've worked with a lot of women. Um, in, in what ways are whoa, men? Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa! What does that mean? Like, I, you assume I've worked with women. What does that mean? <laughs> that you've worked with. A, Every different athlete, every kind of different yeah, 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 professional yeah, yeah. athlete. <laughs> nothing, nothing other implied. Um, in what ways are men and women different in terms of uh, your work? How you how you have to speak to them, teach them, communicate with them? At the top, there's. I mean, okay, so like men and women are different. <laughs> you yes. Know, and thank goodness, and um, you know. Structurally, there's differences, you know, in our frame and um, culturally, the way that we're both raised, it's different. Our sandbox experience is very different. Um, so, our, uh, you know, breaking traditional roles is something that all people are challenged to do. Embracing traditional roles is something that all people are challenged to do. At the at the top of the top of the top, there's there people are more similar because they're all freaking so different. <laughs> And that the, the thing that binds people together is that they're really uniquely them. Mm -hmm. And they're and they're freaking different. And they're the same as all of us. You know, the, they have the same uh, number of bones, same number of muscles, same same kind of uh, size brain, most people, you know, the same capacity to, to harness and control thoughts. So um, at the at the top, top, top of competitors, whether that's in business or sports or music. Um, they're all uniquely themselves, which make them all very similar in that aspect. I do not have conversations differently with men and women. Um, I, you know, I see people as human beings, mm -hmm. and I work to understand their unique journey that led them to now. Um, so, bracing their individualism, bracing them inside of the culture that they identify most with, and um, uh, you know, we all really are ends of one. And if we can amplify and accelerate that mm -hmm. to be the best version of that N1, shit, that's really cool. That's a great answer. Um, talking about teamwork, how do you teach people to or, or teach teams to, say, build trust with one another? Is there anything like better than just spending time together outside of the field, court, whatever? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there are much better people at team building, like team bonding, I should say, than like there's, there's people just that that's all they do in this field of sports psychology. So what I, what I pay attention to in this space is um, when we think of the word trust, we think of trusting another person. That's, I think that that's the wrong starting place. The right starting place is working on being able to trust yourself so that you can honestly know that you can go into any environment and adjust and when you have that level of trust within yourself you you don't need to be dependent on others mm -hmm. but you can you can eloquently work with others and so it's like work on yourself to be able to trust yourself before trying to trust others and it doesn't mean that you're you know a solo pirate by yourself mm -hmm. like that's not what we're talking about but the starting place is like, do you really trust yourself? Do you trust yourself um, in emotionally charged moments when there's nothing physical on the line? Mm -hmm. Do you trust yourself in difficult situations that um, physically? And working on that inner relationship, it sounds so soft, but it's really anything but that. That relationship, that inner dialogue with yourself to be able to trust yourself in uncomfortable and hostile and rugged, both emotionally and physically moments. Right, so that, that you can work with we're... anyone uh, in, in any situation, right? Well, so you can be yourself in any situation. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you know how to trust, uh, I'm sorry, you know how to adjust to any environment. Then, you know what? Like, so tr trusting others is really about, like, I trust that you're going to be late. Mm -hmm. I trust that you're going to be on time. It's just knowing who they are and trusting that most of the time that when we're when we're awake to what other people's psychological framework and as well as behavioral tendencies are, we can trust that most of the time people are relative are going to do fall into that pattern. Mm -hmm. You know, or let me put it on its head, I can trust that, you know, you're really different and I never know what's going to come out of your mouth your mm -hmm. your mouth. So trust is like trusting others is like it's the second thing. 
Right. Not, not the first. I love how you said that too. It, trust is knowing them. That's, that's yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, because, like, I, I can trust flat out that two of my family members that I love deeply are not going to be consistent with the, what, what time they show up. Right. It's just sometimes they'll be on time, sometimes they won't. So if they're going to be involved in, in like something that is timely, um, I've got to build that in and either leave on time because I know that they're going to be 20 minutes late. You know, it's like just having the ability to be fluid. You got to know them first. Mm -hmm. And the only way to know someone else really is to know yourself. That's why the self-discovery process is the first part of the process and the second is then discovering others. Gotcha. Mm. What do you teach guys and girls to do when uh, self-doubt creeps in? Uh, yeah, that good. I mean, that when self-doubt's there, it's like, it's cool because you know you're on the edge. You know you're in that kind of place where you're really being challenged because mm -hmm. you're not really sure if you can do it. And I'll tell you what, that's the space. I don't know. I love it. I just, I love it. I love that as soon as that little voice whispers, you know, to myself, like, you really think you can do that? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay, now. Like, and so it's just this playful, like, that, that's when I know <laughs> right on the edge. So, so what, what, well, how do I help others? It's like, I love that space. And because it's it's reminding me that I'm right on the edge, and I love that I love being right on the edge of capability and capacity. It's where our brain is lit up the most, our mind is most switched on, our physiologically, our our nervous system is most activated, and so the, just like, do you love that or you don't? And so if you don't mm -hmm. love that, self doubt is going to be really challenging because it's going to give you all the reasons. Self-doubt is a fancy little phrase for like all the reasons why you might not be able to do something in the future. And, um, you know, it's, and so it's like this self-preserving mechanism to play it safe. Mm -hmm. And um, you can, you, we can choose to play it safe. It's, it's, that's a whole different way of going through life that I don't know. I, I don't feel very good at that. Right. I'm not a teacher of that. So and there, there will be other people that are better at teaching that than me. Correct me if I'm wrong, too. It, it's almost like a uh, an ignorance or, or a lack of education. I think a lot of people, when they think when they when they doubt themselves, when they feel discomfort, they think that is, that, that that means they're doing something wrong and that they shouldn't continue doing that. Right? They should always feel comfortable, and and doing the right thing means they're going to be always comfortable. So explaining to them that what what exactly what you just said right like the fact that you you're feeling these things is that you're you're really pushing and you're and you're following your dreams or whatever that may be is that accurate uh yeah yeah there's a lot in there like one is self-doubt is not a feeling self-doubt is a thought mm -hmm. so it's like that like they're stitched together but the the self-doubt is a thinking process and um what you just layered on there was uh that you know, like really, what is your philosophy about how you're going to do life? Are you looking, are you just intellectually saying, it's, you know, it sounds cool to be, you know, to live on the edge. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm close to it or getting close to it, I'm going to like beat myself up and freak myself out. Um, so those two, that dissonance is actually really important to pay attention to. And so, um, yeah, th that being said, there's also feelings that come with it, like the, your stomach emotions, you know, butterflies or whatever, and emotions that come with it or sweat that comes with it. So being aware of your thoughts, your, your physical emotions, as well as your physical body sensations, um, all of that's really important in the process. And the more aware you are, the quicker you can course adjust, the quicker you can embrace, the, course, the quicker you can, you know, um, the quicker you can um, move more closely aligned to who you want to be in this moment to align you to be um, the best version of yourself in a future moment. So all, what we're talking about really is the value of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. you know, and then the value of knowing the mechanics of confidence and self-talk and how those do work for you. And that, just take, that does take work though. This isn't like, uh, you know, I, I, I think that I get really concerned about pop psychology. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I don't even know really what that is, I think, but I hear people just saying things that seem really cool, but missing how textured and nuanced and complicated the mind really is. And so um, the, the greatest accelerant we can do is to really go on a path, a lifelong path, to learn who you are. And that comes from the inner dialogue that you have with yourself. 
and that self-talk is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, I mean, look at look at great competitors that are undersized. What? How did that happen? Like, mm -hmm. pick any competitor that's undersized, and and they're one of the most dominant competitors in the world. How did that happen? That is completely psychological, mm -hmm. right? Like, and that part is just, I think, the most fun that we can have is figuring out our natural talents and skills and abilities, and then using our mind to amplify and, su and accelerate that growth. Can you tell me about, uh, f can you talk about Felix uh, Baumgartner? Can I ask you well, about that? Well, yeah, I, I will say that I, it's unbecoming and a, 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 he's, he made it very public that he and I spent time and mm -hmm. we worked together on the Red Bull Stratus Project, which is an incredible team um, experience, like an unbelievable community of people that were so bright and mm -hmm. intelligent and embracing being on the edge. And Felix Baumgartner was um, the, the, the athlete that really changed in my mind and many people's minds what's possible um, for humans. And so, you know, I say, I set, say all that to say that um, he's been very public about our work, but I feel like it's unbecoming for me to talk about one person in particular, just because of the nature of sure. my respect for uh, the legal and ethical space that I hold for people. But I, there are things that are public that I can um, uh, amp uh, like talk about. Right. So, I, I, not knowing your question, I just that's like a, a preamble, I guess. Sure, sure. I, yeah, I totally understand that. So, a little background for anyone that hasn't heard of this: Felix jumped from a some kind of craft that uh, from 128,000 feet, which I think is a little over 24 miles. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, what, what was public is that there was a, a significant amount of fear associated with even just putting on his jumpsuit. And uh, it was also public that Michael helped him get over that. So I'm just wondering, uh, how much you can talk about that? Like, how did you help him overcome that fear? Well, it was, um, one, it was, he, he's incredible. And he really am amplifies what a hero's journey is, you know, and not that we want to be heroes necessarily, but the hero's journey is about, you know, the, the strong man stumbling and the strong man figuring out how to keep going. And I don't mean to be gender um, specific there, but, um, so he was, he, need, he was so talented at his craft and he ran straight to the edge of his capacity like I hope that many of us can figure out to do in our own lives. And he didn't play it safe. He played it um, square down the middle of, of knowing how to trust himself and to trust others uh, in a, in his, inside of his craft of being able to jump from outer space basically or the edge of space. Mm -hmm. And it was he. Knew, he was working on the relationship with um, trust and inner dialogue and self confidence and all that stuff about like uh, how do I keep my mind from you know taking over when I'm in a rugged environment. And he's it, just a beautiful example of uh, we're not just physical beings. We're not just craft specialists. You know, there's the the mental and the spiritual side of being a human. And so he was a. Uh, the, the strong man that raised his hand up that said, I want to work on all parts of being um, great at my craft. And so I know I'm dancing around it. Oh, it's fine. Like, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's the essence of it. Such, a, such an amazing thing that the, that entire organization did. It's, it's so cool. So, oh, yeah. 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 Well, and so that's like somebody walking, walking their talk and talking mm -hmm. their walk. You know, that's it. Right. All right, man. That is all of the questions that I have. This is, uh, I just know this is going to be fascinating to people, so I can't thank you enough. Where can people learn more about you, keep up with you, uh, all of that stuff? Okay. I would love for people to learn about themselves, right? And I would love to start there. And yes, I would love for people to connect to, to, to some of the fun stuff that I'm grateful and fortunate enough to be able to do. But if we just start with you know, one, um, ten, one minute of breathing and mm -hmm. master the inhale and master the exhale. That's it. And do one minute. And if that's too much, start with 30 seconds. And if you can do 30 seconds, though, you can do a minute. And when your mind wanders, which it will, come back to the present moment. Like, just come back to this breath. And if you can do one minute, you, you know you can do two minutes. 
If you can do two, you know you can do four minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like, and when your mind wanders, which it will, just come back. And that's the, one of the accelerants to self-discovery. So I say that because I'd love for people to start there. And then the second is, um, you know, find me on social. I, I love um, this Finding Mastery podcast that that I fired up and I'm building. So it's at findingmastery.net is the website that hosts our podcast. You can also find it on iTunes. And it is conversations with people who are on the path of mastery, just very similar to what you and I are doing about decoding um, the, the path of mastery. And um, so, and, and on Twitter, at Michael Gervais, and that's G-E-R-V-A-I-S. We also have a Facebook community up for Finding Mastery called Finding Mastery, uh, no, it's facebook.com slash community. And, you know, there's uh, Finding Mastery Instagram, what else? Um, if, you, if you're, you know, running a corporation, you go take a look at winforever.com. It's the partnership with Coach Carolina that I are doing. And um, I don't know, if you're in the, on the West Coast and love surfing, maybe I'll see you out in the ocean. Nice, perfect. I'm going to take you up on that. Yeah, anytime. Guys, we're we're gonna uh, we're gonna put all of those links in the show notes, and you can find that at brutestrengthtraining.com slash podcast. Mike, thank you so much, man. Appreciate all it, right, brother. Appreciate being part of your community. Thanks so much. Best success success to all your listeners, and and best success. Um, congratulations to what you've been able to contribute to the field. So, thank you for having me on. Thank you, man. Bye. Okay, take care. Bye.